where we were, there was like loads of fast cars. We would steal Sierra Cosworths, me, uh, you, Lakey. Calibra 16 Lake. valve 4x4, four four. catch me doing Six, donuts yeah. around the... 16 Jeez. valve... Um, <laughs> G GTIs, uh, fucking Astros. That we'd when we was bored, yeah. we'd ram the police for a chase. Yeah. You need the Kellervision app. 24-7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top five, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Music and street culture. Killer podcast. Oh, my day just couldn't get any better. I've just, this is, this is fucking. We're actually awesome. recording. We are recording. Hey! Hey! Oh, that's us there. Look. Hello, everybody. We're in the house. Mother fathers. I've just seen someone matching my description. Yeah. <laughs> the middle. It's 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 yeah. One on the end. And on the left, we have a tag. You're that way. <laughs> on the camera, you're that way. This is weird. Yes, Whoa. Ways <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's going to get a podcast. As you guessed it, we're reporting live from London Central. London Central is unique to be. Big shout out to graffitikings.co.uk. Television app and effect. Skinny man and Mongo. You don't know. Mud Mongo, family. they play it in the Congo. He doesn't drink Strongbow. <laughs> he doesn't drink Strongbow. <laughs> he did it for a long though. Listen, what's going on? <laughs> We're in the house of Killer 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 Killer's podcast. Killer Killer's yeah, what's going on? That's um, what I'm saying. That's what I'm should, saying. Should we say this should be the first of many to come? Because like, we're that. going to be a regular feature now. We know where you live. We <laughs> 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 know, know where you live. They all know where I and, live. And I think <laughs> this is going to be short and sweet. So the next one can be like long and really drawn out. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah like yeah. we could do like a marathon. The mud a, a marathon. A mud marathon. A, a, a mudathon. A mud mudathon. There you go. Mud family man. Inside out. I mean, I can't think of two more respectable, high up there proprietors of mud family. Who the fuck's he doing? Who the fuck's he on about? Oh, well, tell me who else is in my family. Oh, of the family lambs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Who um, else is in? Well, started as a two, went to a three, and, and then a, a 17, and then 12 T. Uh, <laughs> yeah. They just don't die, they multiply. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Mm. Um, mud fam was originally a feeling that we had as brothers, brothers in mud, bonded in mud. Yeah. Um, coming from our beginnings with our peers, which would have been the fire posse. Indeedy. Um, Finch MVP. Park, feed the poor, fuck the police. <laughs> fire the posse. Yeah. Um, <laughs> wow. Feed the park. Um, yeah. Free the people. Feed the poor. Um, yeah, fire posse. So that was our... Our roots. We come from fire posse. Don't ever ramp, fam. <laughs> Never do that, fam. Fire posse, fam. <laughs> and um, because of that, we was just doing our thing. I mean, we're talking about musically here, not lifestyle. No. Musically. Um, then the Berry Crew was popping off. We've got to give the ratings to Vincent Barnett. Indeed. To Intense. Shocking B, who yep. was doing Old the thing, early Ooh. foundation from the jungle list. Yeah. And I think with cool Shocking B and Intense. Yeah. And the like-minded AI likes around us going to Highbury Grove Youth Centre. Mm. There was a little collective of people from that area. Me and Mono was familiar to that area because of the children's home kind many of a friend and family demograph. Yeah. Um, me and Mono come from having friends, many a friend from the children's home And their demograph. kitchens were always stocked and we used to break in at night and cook burgers. Mm. So because of that, that's how our kind of like familiarity mm -hmm. with the crew from Highbury. Um, musically, it was always flourishing, and the fact it's that, rap. It's, it, yeah. was, it was rap all but day. The fact like that yeah, basically, but we were um, rare grooves and raggerheads as well. Because the these guys, before, before we go any further, let me just specify here, because for the international crew that may be living under some sort of a, a, a rock in the middle of nowhere, the Mud Family, <laughs> Skinny Man Mongo, these are, these are figureheads in the UK hip-hop scene. Uh, music releases, God knows. what. Well, I mean, these guys are humble cats, man, but let's be real. You guys were... I remember first seeing you boys, and I, I tout this fucking story all the fucking time. Yeah. 1997, Fresh UK, Folkestone, Kent. Mm, Mud yeah. was in the building, and then Mickey me. Blue Eyes, the rap Sinatra. Oh, tight, oh, tight, Mickey Blue Eyes. And look, I, I co promoted the, and created the event, wasn't he, for 97? Yeah. Mm. And uh, man, from that moment, you guys, arguably, I can't think of anyone else in my mind who not only did I feel embodied London hip hop so raucously and so on on the edge for me as an 18 year old kid I was like whoa these guys are fucking hardcore and and you walked out you talked to it and that was and that's just me praising you guys for being the greats you did are did we rap or were we just 
I there. Think, yeah, I think <laughs> we were there we, we, and you were present. We were just living oh, okay. our lives and, and we were always rapping about our lives whilst living our lives. So depending what age you would have caught me a mono, we were um, both born as twins at the age of 10 in exactly, Georgia. Yeah, basically, yeah. Mm. And um, so like we say, big up to Intense V, who kind of moulded and was a backbone um, inspiration to mm. all of the kids from Highbury, mm. Canterbury and Finsbury. Yeah, for real. Because that meant that I mean, Michael Johnson was already doing his thing from early day. Dot. He's one of the first people who force and KG. Yeah, and um, the dominant force. Dominant force. Dominant Ooh. force. Rusty Ranks. Yeah. Michael Johnson, putting it down. Um, them times yeah. there. Berry Crew's going. Yes, we actually have this going on. Um, we can say that from the Berry Crew. I'd like to try mention as many people as I can, and if you could help me with this, yeah. we're talking about Twilight Eyes, Adrian. Twilight Nocturnal. Eyes. Nocturnal. Nocturnal. Nox, one of the Best. Is that Adrian? Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Farmer, um, Chester. Farmer, yeah, Chester. Yeah, hold yeah. tight. Spiteri. Yeah. Both the Spiteri brothers. Yeah, that's so that's Mark and Sparks Keith. and uh, Mania. Um, I mean, who else we talking about here? Uh, BFG, DJ BFG. BFG. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that little collective, for me and Mono to be like, man, these that are on a musical vibe because the crew that me and Mono hang around with in Finji Park weren't on no musical vibe. I mean, they <laughs> yeah. liked music. It was on a vibe. But they, and it was on a vibe. Mind you, we, we played. Everyone, <laughs> everyone, everyone danced though, didn't we? But we, we, did, danced. Dance. we, we did, did dance. We did dance. I mean, so for yeah. us, where we did dance and we used to be in Elfhorn Park practicing our dance routines, I think the fire posse started because we all started learning our dance routines. We saw that our powers in numbers was when we once went to a Jazzy B dance mm. in... Moswell Hill, and they started to play Sugar Bear. Oh, sure. Um, don't scandalize mine. <laughs> we had been doing this routine, the whole crew in the park every day, like meeting up as gang gang and that. Mm. We used to do this routine, a dance routine to right. Don't Scandalize Mine. Um, so we're in the dance, it's soul to soul versus some sound system in a big um, warehouse in Moswell Hill. Mm. And I think our crew was scattered about the dance. So you couldn't really see in numbers how many they were. Oh. Until, <laughs> until that song come on <laughs> and we all kind of like merged into the middle in. of the dance floor and kind of all started doing this dance routine that we had been practicing to Don't Scandalize Mine. And people were like, rah, they are a massive crew. What's their name? Fire Posse. And, um, Do you remember how the crew got in? I swear, either we had it first or remember when Westwood in high fashion, yeah. we walked in and it was like, oh, it's the fire posse. Yeah, the fire posse. Because fire used to be in bait anyway, but yeah. it was like, no, they're not fire. Like. Yeah. Wow. And um, so from fire posse... I think Miss Melody was there that night as well. We, we would do our thing, dancing, the culture, graffiti, rapping, everything. Mm. The Berry Crew... They were fully engrossed in the culture. Oh, yeah. They us. attacked. They well, attacked MCs. everything. So, man. so for MCs. us to link up with them, it was only a natural mm -hmm. um, progression because mm. um, they're our family mm -hmm. before even music or after music yeah. or even if there was no music. Yeah, them, me and Intense used to go primary fam. school as well. Yeah. Like I say, all of the children who grew up in the children's home demograph, whether mm -hmm. you could go home to your parents or on a night or not, we kind of formed them, bonded as brothers in arms, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. unified as one big family. Mm. And I suppose that's where the feeling of us realising that we are mud Mm. And, and the philosophy of mud is that from the mud we came into the mud we will surely return um, I we, love that we are, you say mud is thicker than blood we, uh, uh, blood is thicker than water mud is thicker than blood mud is thicker than blood yeah and, um, I and plus uh, as well remember um, Jerry Springer and she goes I ain't having no mud babies we was yeah, like what mud babies yeah. where mud babies <laughs> 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 and our dogs and our mud wheelers. Yeah, the um, mud wheelers. Mud wheelers. And, mud wheelers, and, wheelers. And, um, <laughs> so I think that what kind of happened is um, with me and Mono living our life being very musical, we could say that we would have been North London's version of Silent Bob and Jay. <laughs> Silent Jay and Bob. Silent Jay and Bob. <laughs> but like some some, some more rats of Camden Bridge. <laughs> You know, um, while I was getting our little papers for distributing herbal medicine and what I think Beatbox and Rap travelled with us since we were kids. Yeah, and tapping on the, beat, and uh, tapping oh, on the, the window. window. Yeah. Basically, I mean, get on the bus. 808 Roland, they yeah. should have sampled the back of a bus window. Yeah. Like, yeah. Doo, doo, doo. And, and a clipper lighter. A clipper lighter. Uh, that vibe alone on a but bus. But yeah, I know about beatboxing. Bla blazing it up, blazing it up, and um, just yeah. vibes in on your way to Chocadero to go clap out the place. Yeah, for real. Um, what was the shop that had the average jacket? Like Mash. Yeah, Mash. Mash. Chocadero. Yeah. Oh, do you remember Mash? Yeah. We do. We remember Mash. Yeah. We mashed down Mash. Um, so <laughs> I think like we've always been musical. We've always been in it. Berry Crew, who really engrossed themselves in the culture and was doing their thing. They was kind of like Highbury, Canterbury. Well, we're like, well, we're in Finsbury, so we're the Finsbury leg of the Berry Crew. Yeah. So mm. And I was in Tufnell Park, so I was a Tufnell Pakistani. Yeah. Mm. So, mm. 
Tufnel Park. Mm. I, thought, yeah. I was never, I was, I was, I was never in the Berry, except for I lived. But he was always close in the, to the Berry. He was always in the Berry. I was but in the Berry. Reside in the Berry. I was fully in the mud. Yeah, I was yeah. In, yeah. You know. mm. were deep in it, weren't you? So I think that? from that, we've ever seen the Berry crew being a massive collective of all of us MCs who mm. were all brothers in arms. Mm. Then who's socialising with each other? differently me and mono hang around and then chester was hanging around with us and we love chester's spirit he's our little bro yeah yeah, yeah. not only he that, goes in he goes in mm. i mean i believe he's the most talented poet that uk has most, produced most, since most wordsworth most and kipling mm, so i mean me and mono i fair uh, it's fair to speak on behalf of both of us we've always been in awe of our little brother of angel face terror mm. that angel face terror yeah. yeah we've always been in awe of our little chester's brother. chester but angel face terror is the chester p and uh, before, yeah. And uh, yeah. because he brings the element that he brings, we mm. was kind of like, well, we've just only got to be ourselves and let him be him. Mm. Hell yeah. and, and together we're doing this thing and, and as AI well, Like likes. a secret we weapon, like... No, yeah, 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 was the, the, yeah, yeah, kind it's of. It's kind of like we bounce off him and we're yeah. inspired because we rap anyway, but he's really rapping mm. and he's really been poetic and depth and... And not only that, and mm. the energy would and... rise up from the floor and he would be standing on the edge of the stage certain times where most people would fall off tiptoes, mm. but he's so engrossed in the freestyle, he's like... Defying gravity. Yeah, defying yeah. gravity with his balance, looking over the stage freestyle. <laughs> Through his yeah. hair. We know that about Big him. Yeah, yeah, Do you know how hard that is for some people to, to put in their heads that the idea that somebody that inspires you so much is in your circle? Yeah, he's really, our little brother. He's yeah. our little brother. He's not in our uh, circle. He's our little bro yeah. broski. A lot and of people would never have that experience, which yeah. is crazy. So, I mean, mm. uh, me and Mono are just like, we're mad. <laughs> we're mad. Mm. And um, to see Chester's energy, we just plugged into that and it was yeah. like, can we do this? This is a mud family thing. Mm. Now, <clears throat> being muddy was something that me and Mono had been resonating with for years before we thought of being the mud fam. Mm. Mm. When it did actually form and we had to put thought into what it actually meant to us, we put even more thought yeah. into it and we thought, That's well, if we're mud... Yeah. Mad I'm, underdogs, though. And watch how we're really fucking mad as well. And, and <laughs> to be an underdog, they was like, an underdog of what? So then we kind of looked at it on a wider scale of how our mm. heart tells us what mud family is. Mm. People would be like, who are the members? And I'll be like, Whoever recognises yeah. themselves to be yeah, one is the member. Mm. What are the rules? The rules is that there are no rules. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so we kind of kept it like Morals, that. It. And um, for my philosophy, a shared philosophy mm. of ours growing up together, resonating with this um, thing of mud. Mud we come, mud we shall return. Mad underdog. Mm. We are family. Through this, we can relate. We are all relative through matter. Six steps of separation. We are all family. We are all the family of mm. of humans on planet mm. Earth. Um, and if we you tell him if you can relate to that, that you're a relative. You're of the a relative because you're related. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so, relative is matter, and relative is family. Mm. Um, and for all my individual living youth, is family because we've always yeah. striven to try and bring about change, awareness and betterment for the children of the next generation. When we look at the further scale of how we're mad underdogs, we are the 90% of the economical dispositioned to mm. the 10% and the 1% who control the world's mm. economical infrastructure at mm. the pyramid scheme. Um, so we're underdogs to the whole foundation of society. But and without that, us... There's I no, mean, 90 percent no of us are the ninety percent yeah. of the human race are the underdogs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that is who Mud Family is. Mm. Uh, who are we to say any differ? The um, th this this sentiment and the, you know the, the whole sentiment of Mud, it <clears throat> it intrigues me to suggest that you you was almost like for both of you guys, rap found you because hip hop found you because you guys would have been doing this anyway. It's just you had that as a that became your conduit. Do you know yes. what I mean? Yeah, As absolutely. creative bastards, we needed an outlet. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I mean, um, don't think that it's just rap that we do. No, no. No, you do everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Uh, he graph writer as well, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, no, I mean, but it's not just that, like, all right, we, we got... Fl uh, we do poetry. I did something. I used to do freestyle poetry. I called it flowetry back in the days. Mm. There was some stigma as to who stole what name or whatever. Then I let it go and I realised that the ego is... 
fucking flaccid. Yeah. You get me? Oh, yeah. So well, uh, I learned from Peter Tosh, Peter, the great Peter McIntosh, oh, many, many it. years ago, that ego is the destruction of all mankind. Which is fact. And I applied that. I've got to remind myself of that every now and again. But both of you, though, in that Pardon. same respect, <laughs> you, in that same respect, though, I've, n I've never felt like I'm out of my depths hanging out with you in an area I don't know. It's like, you guys know everybody. <laughs> like, yeah. You walk down the road, skinny, mo, skinny, mother, skinny. You know what I mean? But you know what it is, yeah? As, as well as that it being recognised or not, which I shunned from many times because being a face and, and, and having ulterior motives of revenue is not a great thing around certain circles. I but another you. thing is, if we carry this... This thing, like, we used to be in Camden all the time. I call it Itchy Town because mm. if you stand there too long, you get this little vibe and you move. And as soon as you move, something happens where you were stood. Yeah. Usually the police or some madness, yeah? Has many other reasons for being Itchy Town of course as well. It does. A lot of the junkies the king of from... Pubs, yeah. though. The, the king, king of when, when the King's really. Cross crack um, epidemic was um, dispelled, a lot of the Pushed people into came, the flats, basically. came to um, Camden as their second mm. alternative. Yeah. And when junkies are rattling for their need to yeah. alleviate their pain... Their, their veins itch because their blood circulation from heroin yep. um, clogs. Mm. So they're there scratching what we call rattling, mm. and um, hence the term itchy town, where mm. everybody seems to be scratching themselves because mm. they're rattling for their fix. Mm. Yeah, basically. So it has a couple of meanings. But with, with the itchy town, see, itchy town is like barter town. Camden's like barter town. We went there as kids and we learned to barter. We could have nothing and make money. Mm. Uh, we could have nothing, literally. God's and power. Make money. God's power. <laughs> mm. so, so, and, and, uh, just yeah. make money out. Yeah, out of nothing. That, we learned we learned we learned to sell various things in about seven languages very quickly. Yeah. So we were That's talking incredible. to everyone. Uh and then, you know, we had our Gambian brothers come over and it was like, yo, we're speaking Wolof now. And everybody's muddy. And it was like we were a little like everyone looking out for each other kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But we was all getting our slice. I think a know? beautiful lesson that we learned from Camden Bridge is that it's an international tourist attraction. Mm -hmm. So to apply yourself to Camden Bridge is to apply yourself to, to an international market mm. um, where you have to learn how to communicate Touristy, through body, body language, yep. body More language and, and minimum um, words. Yeah, don't confuse lost, people. Lost, <laughs> lost in translation. Um, mm. One of the most famous times that I got lost in translation mm. in Camden Bridge was when two ladies, young ladies, I mean, like, elderly teenage or young 20s, young mm -hmm. ladies, mm -hmm. had um, wanted to come and purchase some medicinal herbs. Mm -hmm. And um, they was like, where's the medicinal herbs? I was like, I got that. Mm -hmm. They was like, well, we want to see it. And I was like, well, where's the money? They was like, it's in my fanny pack. And I was like, oh, <laughs> it's in your what? <laughs> you can keep that money. <laughs> like, yo. Yeah. And, and I'm being lost in translation. I had to sit and talk to these two American girls and be like, point to your fanny pack. Yeah. And I went, your bum bag. Yeah. Uh, I was like, listen, we got lost in translation. Uh, let me explain to you in England what we know as the fanny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they was like, oh, no, that's our fanny. I was like, no, in England, that's your fanny. So don't be going around telling people it's in your fanny pack <laughs> because you might, um, you know, get lost in translation. Just got to get my fanny pack so, out. So, yeah, so um, King's Cross learned us how to... Camden, yeah. Camden yeah. Bridge learned us how to deal with people on an international scale. Um, great learning curve experience. And still prominent out there. I mean, yeah. the rock and roll has not left Camden as we know it. You know, see Camden is the scratchy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> For real, the rock and the roll. But uh, I tell you what, like, I think because Camden, because we're Camden is, yeah, it's like poverty and millionaires, bam, right there. Yeah. Okay? So you've got... Primrose Hill, Regent's Park, like billionaires, and you've got Camden, Kentish Town, and, and it's like, but plus some of the schools mix, so you get a good mix of friends and that. Mm. But what I've always found is, is Itchy Town, Camden is a bit like Hollywood. People go there to make it a bracket, yeah? yeah? So musicians will always end up there, mm. and they'll be like, yeah, I'm here, well, we're in amongst the nightlife, wait a minute, this night has turned into mm. daylife, I've been up for three days, what's going on? And these musicians, they, shh, yeah. I've seen them all, you know what I mean? Mm. Like. Some of them very prominent uh, artists have, have died just through being in Camden yeah, mm -hmm. and being addicted to being addicted. There's yeah? an under there's an underground scene in the nightlife of Camden which I've only been exposed to a number of times. It's behind the doors. Did you go back? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Multiple times. <laughs> Multiple but, times. But, but, you know, it's a real, uh, it's a behind the curtain thing. It is, and it always yeah. has been. Since we were children, me and it my brother noticed the stage. Yeah, yeah. Put it that way. It ain't what's in no, the no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's what you don't know. <laughs> it's what you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. Um, 
the music. The music, because, you know, obviously those that aren't susceptible to coming into uh, the great itchy town, they heard... Well, I heard some of the earliest stuff was uh, Ronin Records mm -hmm. and what you got... It was my first outing where I was like, these guys I met at Fresh, mm. I want to know. Mm. I want to know more. Well, I think all of our peers around us who were a couple of years senior to us um, from the early... Um, very beginning stages of the UK hip hop and graffiti culture scene. Um, if we hail out legends such as Robbo, mm -hmm. PIC, mm -hmm. and Shoe Two. 2, Sub One, XL502. Yep. Yes. I mean, the list is endless. Car 138. Uh, for, we could go on and on and on. And I think what it was is within that community, they had kind of observed. Skinny and Mono just rap on the bridge all day. Someone's got to get that energy. Mm. And I think I've got to give credit to Axilla for being mm. persistent to be like, come on, guys. Just come around my house. <laughs> <laughs> and this is some beats. We're like, what? No, no, like, we're doing this. <laughs> yeah, like, oh, when? When are we going to come around your yard and listen to beats? Don't you know Camden Bridge is waiting for us? Like, and, and, and all of this and that. This and I think yeah. through his persistence <clears throat> and perseverance, he managed to um, get us around his house listening to beats. We're pulling out the pen and pad, and it's kind of like, all right, then let's do what we normally do on Camden Bridge and do it to some of Aggie's beats. Mm -hmm. Hence, that became our recordings with Ronin Records. What was it called? The Mud Files? Mud Files. Mud Files. The Mud Files. Ooh. Yeah. That, if you don't know about Mud Files, get to know that, that seminal moment. So that was our first chance to like actually put it down and have it put down on wax. Yeah. The age that we were... It was a dream come true, mm, you know. Yeah. Like we're actually rapping. Mm. Uh, we've got a record. How old down. were you boys at that time, roughly? How old were they? Mentally? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> actually, uh, actually, I don't know. You know, twenty. I don't even. No, know. it wouldn't have been twenty because Jarrell wasn't born. Uh, we can actually do the maths. Yeah, we were. We would have been twenty-six, twenty-five. No, oh, no, 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 like nineteens. Yeah, nineteen years old. So I must have been what about seventeen, sixteen at the time. <gasps> wow. Um, although, it, it seems mad, but let me actually state this. The fact that we got our first recording, I think it might have been 1995. It says on the record. Or no, yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. But the fact that we got our first recording out then, I mean, me and Mono, Chester, Berry Crew, Mud mm. Fam, Skinny Man as, as an entity and Mongo as an entity, mm. have been actively inputs in the arts, whether it be music, theatre production, helping people songwrite, helping people set up sound systems, um, doing mixtapes, poetry, all kind of things. We've been musically involved from we was 10, mm -hmm. musically active and, and um, creatively active in the arts in many different um, avenues, mm -hmm. as well as being on the road trying to survive mm. um, as little street urchins that we are. So the fact that we got um, our first recording when we was in our late 19s, mm. we had actually been to places like Raw Material mm. when we was like 12 and 13 and recorded. Oh, so you had kind of serious material. No, no, no. We had, we, had always, done it. we had always aspired to do it. Um, oh, yeah. We, I mean, we'd done it when it was Michael Johnson doing Dominant Force. Mm. We was active then. Course, we would go to right. these Westwood rap competitions. Yeah. We would go to these round the clock oh, rap competitions. Long. We would, um, we was always active. We would um, put on our own stage shows mm. and put on our own rap seminars yeah. um, independently from our own means of finance that we earn on Camden Bridge. Yeah. Um, so, so many things that we was doing actively. Um, I even remember when we was about 12, we got sent to Unity Studios under Finji Park yeah. by old Rasta man who said, yo, the rest of the old Rasta man them around there have been given a grant <laughs> so that you lot can go around there and then studio facilities are for the children of this community to go around and have a recording uh, facility yeah. at their disposal. Mm. These Rastaman elders are being given a grant to that effect. Mm. So we've got around there, knocked on their door, and the dreads have opened the door, and we're like, yo, we've been sent around here <laughs> to record, and like, we had to up our wide move. <laughs> and we're like, right, it's like that, yeah? <laughs> and I mean, so we were trying, you know, mm. we were trying to get our foot in, and we was like, look, how much is it to get a studio? We was messing about with sound and money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we was messing about with so before we got our release at the age of nineteen, I suppose it was I a was long time. I was messing around record labels and using their downtime as well, and we was making yeah. jungle as well. Yeah. And then they, yeah. they yeah. took hours. Which was the thing? Well. Which was the thing people would do? They'd give you yeah. like the, the yeah. extras on what would be there. That the hours. That's right. A lot of bands because they'd that actually way as well. call up for some um, some of what he was saying. Mm. 
And then we just end up there, innit? We're like, all right, what else you got for us, then? And we go, all right, let's use some of your time or whatever. Yeah. But Sound of Money Studios was a great time, I think, as far as Mud Fam and Berry Crew and, and, and us be, becoming uh, more muddy. Cool. And um, the studio in King's Cross with Norton and Dave. Elizabeth Troy was recording yeah, there. That was the sour, Sound of uh, the Underground, Sour, sour Records. Sour Records, yeah. Sound of the Underground, who yeah. did um, UK That's Apache when we was doing and that jungle little thing there. MJ Cole yeah. and that. And um, we was in there show, yeah. doing pre production yeah. stuff then. Um, so we was always active in it. We always wanted a foot in. We was always trying to be creative. We was, so the fact that we brought our material out for the first time as, when we was about 19. Mm was a long time coming because mm. we had been trying since the ages of 11 and 12 to... Building up them 10,000 yeah. hours, basically. Yeah. yeah, That's crazy. And then how much stuff do you think is not out there in the public that people would, um, you think people would love to hear? Regarding what? The well, some that stuff, I'd like yeah. to hear. We used to rap for, you know what DAT tapes are? There was ADAT tapes as well. Yeah. We used the to big freestyle boys, yeah. the whole ADAT tape. What? Yeah, we'd freestyle the whole thing. We'd Someone used hours. to give me dictaphones and go, yeah, this will help you. Like, even my mum used to go, Alec, this will help you with your rapping. <laughs> and I'd think, it won't, because I'll freestyle over the whole memory or yeah. tape, <laughs> and then I want to record over that for another freestyle. Freestyles <laughs> are just freestyles. I think there was a very big learning curve for the first time we knew that we had to sit down and write and compose structured yeah. lyrics. <laughs> it was like, what? Well, we do. Felt like schoolwork. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we we did it anyway. Agzi. And memorize. Yes, Agzi. Got, yeah. You made us do it, Agzi. Sure. Like Agzi's like um <laughs> like a, a it was detention. The, yeah. the crafty supply teacher. Yeah. You know, yeah. he was like, Come on, kids. You're not a teacher. You're one of <laughs> yeah, us. Yeah, 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 well, just draw a little picture. Here's some crayons. You know, like, and he got us to do it. Mate, I, I, I had this conversation with Tiggs the author the other day, and uh, yeah, producers are like some of the most uh, calculative, timekeeping, structured people on the... Without that, music is done. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yep. Yeah, big up all of the people who create music and create creativity and creations. Um, I think one thing at a very early stage is, for me, that let me know that I'm very biased. Mm would be, people would be like, who do you like, Kumo cool D or LO Cool J? So we're talking about the early separation mm. of having to pick and choose. Mm. Up until that point, it was like, check out all these great rappers. Then it's like, yeah, Kumo cool D went and dissed my man mm. from that club and we heard the tape mm. and was like, oh, he took it to his neck. And mm. then it was like, right, Kumo cool D versus LO Cool J. Who do you like? And I, and I was like, well, I'll tell you the truth. I think they're both brilliant. Mm. And then <laughs> I had to realise that if uh, anybody comes up to me of any age, gender, sex or background, came up to me and was like, here's this little four-line poem that I've started, I would appreciate and love that. So I realised that I was biased because anybody who was doing anything, I was like, I love it, I love it. Mm -hmm. you know, like, and I would really encourage it. And So you didn't have to be the best rapper mm -hmm. to win me over. Mm -hmm. You just had to tell me that you was working on writing a rap and I'll be won over. So I'm easily won over because I'm mm -hmm. biased to the love of creation, creativity, music, poetry. It takes a lot for art. someone to show you what they, they made like, yeah, and they're does. genuine. Mm -hmm. Not just bullshit raps. like Something mm -hmm. when you go, oh, there's essence in there, there's substance mm -hmm. there. Yeah, cause creativity is medicine. Like, it helped me a lot. Mm. I caught I caught creative itis a few years ago, and it like it helped me like heal in many ways. You get what I'm saying? Mm. Um, it helped me. Um, I was doing a lot of chemical research, innit? So like it helped me come out. You mm. know what I'm saying? Like from all that bullshit. At a very young age, it was made apparent to me and Mono that people wanted to control expression. Mm. And we hadn't fully grasped what the agenda was, but we we came round to the understanding, yeah, the overstanding of it very yeah, quickly. Yeah, yeah. Mm. What we came to learn is that through music, art, dance, and creative expression, you can threaten political <laughs> regimes. Yes. <laughs> so with us coming to that realization, we then put a study, and this is when we was like 12 years old. We kind of looked in depth as to what that meant for us. And it meant that anybody who wanted to release music on a pop level, popular level, um, had to fit to certain criteria. You couldn't threaten the regime musically. Mm. Mm. And a great lesson of that for me and Mono was um, God Save the Queen by the Sex Pistols, which was a tune of our youth that we really resonated. Anarchist in the UK, mm. um, the fascist regime of the royal family mm. uh, and everything. Mm. That, 
And so we realised that that year when it made number one in the charts, we were there watching Top of the Pops and um, it's went, and at number two is blah, blah, blah. And good night, folks. Mm. And it was like, what about at number mm. one is the Sex Pistols, God Save the Queen? They didn't want to know So it. we was recognising that there was powers <clears throat> that be in play that make sure that there's a certain regime that they don't wish to have threatened. And the way that they mean to have that threatened... A control. It is for expression yeah. of art. Mm. They control it, man. Graffiti or art, dance, expression, mm. musical expression, rap, uh, poetry. Um, fashion, they just tend fashion. to steal it. They steal it, so it's gone now. It's not so yours all of these forms of expression, I mean, the kilt, the kilt, the Scottish kilt mm. was outlawed. So especially fashion. Mad. You, you know? Mm. Um, so, so we come to look at these things and then me and Mono actually stumbled on something that was a real beautiful realisation for us, is that if we look in history how long this has been in place. Mm. To actually be a musician and get your stuff out there back in the day, it had to be through the Royal Institution of Music. music yeah. If you wanted to do drawings, it had to be through the Royal Institution of Art. To be committed, if, yeah. you know, the control. Royal Institution of Science, we'll control the regime of what mm. we see fit to mm. co-sign and put out. So and the BBC became as well. But so then what we realised is that within children's nursery rhymes was the real revolutionary messages and that there used to be undertones in poems with children's nursery rhymes that would have a political agenda that mm. you wouldn't realise. And this goes as far as Humpty Dumpty mm. was a song with political agendas to it for the time. Um, when we look at um, a tissue, a tissue, we all fall down. Yeah, that was the plague. So we look at how <coughs> these nursery rhymes use clever ways to... To keep the story alive and, and the narrative, if you look... And the narrative yeah, alive yeah. through children's nursery rhymes mm. that wouldn't be subjected to scrutiny mm. from the authorities that mm. might think that it might threaten their regime. Because it's all nice and jolly. Yeah. It cuts through, though. I think at the same time me and Mono was coming <coughs> to that realisation, we got to watch an interview with Peter Tosh. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, I beg people to refer to this interview of Peter Tosh when he's talking about the music industry, what they about Prince do, and yeah. Michael Jackson, about them withholding the release of his music and not supplying the demand, etc., etc., and why he felt that this was happening to his music. Wow. Because of the political agendas you heard that, it. that go on. So <clears throat> at a very young age, me and Mono stumbled upon the power of words, powers and sound. Yeah, for real. And then... And it, timing. And timing. <laughs> and, then, and then it was cemented by people like Peter McIntosh's interview mm. that just cemented what we already resonated as a truth and just made it official. Mm. Yeah, that's... Do you think, I think that's an artist way, like nowadays, I think about some of the albums that really did cut through with such a, alarm bells, but the way that they were packaged was a sweet melody. Do you know what I mean? Yes. This, that, it, it, you know, John Lydon and Sex Pistols and those guys, they had an, an aggressive attack. On Straight in your face. But yeah. then there were no apologies. The subtleties of some of those musical pieces, which, you know, you know, like uh, Reaganomics here, where he, what he walk on with, um, uh, um, Born in the USA, wasn't it? Yeah, and yeah. it's like, that was a protest song. Yeah, that was a protest song. But the irony that, you know, but he didn't hear it for the lyrics that it was. Well, we've also saw that even <coughs> within the Tony Blair Labour campaign, he used Britpop as his mm. vehicle. Blatantly. To <laughs> oh God. push his political agenda, which went totally against the music that he was using. Yeah. Um, when we talk about these regimes, uh, one from yesteryear... Mm. Just, I'd just like to, whilst on this podcast, yeah. point out some of the obvious um, infrastructures that still go on today with institutionalised racism within the music industry mm, 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 that, that mm. we face. Yep. Um, I have what you would call in our society today white privilege, which I accept and I acknowledge. Um, but the music that I make mm, is... Mm urban music for lower working class environments because I'm talking about my first-hand experiences of what I know. Um, when I look at the start of... May I? Yeah. When I look at the start of BBC, realising that they have to now accommodate to a demograph of something that they're not used to, mm. being the black British audience... Mm. Um, they wanted to accommodate to the black British audience without trying to be offensive. 
So the first thing that they did, trying not to be offensive, that was offensive, was called it urban, urban music. Urban music. Mm. <laughs> so, so if you're going to change yeah. the word yeah. from black to urban, mm. there's going to be many uh, argument to entertain, mm. if I may advocate, blah, blah, urban sheep, have you any wool? Mm. I'm going to be that offensive and outrageous mm. in, in what I'm saying right here to the people and the viewers at home so I can really get my point across. Um, you know, we can't write on the blackboard anymore. Is that now the urban it's board? The whiteboard, no? mm, the whiteboard. But is it the urban board yeah. for the one that's still black? You, you know, yeah. so, so then, I, then I put this argument. I looked at their urban charts and their urban charts was dominated by people who were almost more than rural countryside mm -hmm. folk. Mm -hmm. Destiny's Child, mm -hmm. Alabama, Texas, country folk, mm -hmm. as they speak of. Uh, Missy Elliott, country folk. Timberland, country folk. Mm -hmm. it, the charts seem to be dominated by country folk mm -hmm. in the urban charts. Mm -hmm. uh, if I make a country and western song in an urban environment, it's urban music because that's where I made it. Mm -hmm. If I make a hip-hop song in the countryside, it's not urban music because it wasn't made in any urban environment. Mm -hmm. It's countryside hip-hop. Mm -hmm. So these were the dangers of, of for one, undermining the word black and what that means to the mm. black audience mm -hmm. and black music and black yep. creativity and ownership, yeah. and ownership by calling it urban and then confusing the demograph of what we know to be urban, suburban and rural. Mm. Mm. Because if someone's making pigeon hip hop in it, pigeon yeah. in, but pigeon in it where it makes no sense, please make it make sense. Mm. If you're from the most rural part of the countryside and you make hip hop, then is it. Then it's country. not urban. No, it's and country. If, and if you live in the middle of Camden <clears throat> Town and you make country and western, that's urban. Mm. Like so, we're confusing the demograph here. Mm. In the city, kids that are making music of a, you know, a lower class. Yeah, but only until recently were they allowed to be the face of their own music. Yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, I don't. They're, put they're sliding. I don't what's put his name? Of older. Ed shenanigans, and he'll be in there straight away, and he'll be like, "Yeah, he's acceptable. Fuck it, yeah, let's go." Mm -hmm. See, I don't put a demographic on talent because talent is not on the talent mm -hmm. for sure, for mm -hmm. sure. So, so for me, social standing, <laughs> possibly, or, or, or and something to talk. So, yeah, yeah. no, just making. If, if, it if I more. may go further onto that point yeah. of what I saw with the um, bamboozle black culture, one extra. Yeah. Um, their lead advert for their campaign was a song by a Jamaican collective called T.O.K. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if everyone remembers the start of the advert. My crew, my dogs, oh, set yeah, yeah, rules, yeah, yeah. set laws. We represent for the... Yeah. BBC One Extra is starting a new black urban... Yes, right? I did. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, before they even started broadcasting... The same song that they used to promote the advertisement of their new channel was banned from the playlist before they even f did their first broadcast. What? Because what they had done is they had come to the realisation that there was homophobic content within the material of the song. So then they had decided that they're going to make sure that there's no homophobic content within any of the music played in the mm. reggae sector. Mm. And what that issue had with myself is that the people of Jamaica, whose reggae m music has influenced the world over. Over and over and over. Over and over, over and over and continues yeah. to do so. Um, have been colonialized, indoctrinated and beaten over the head mm. with their colonialist Bible, mm. who has taught them for 400 years that you must obey the laws of this good book. And in the laws of the good book, they have been indoctrinated to believe that homosexuality and the act of sexual buggery is to be forbidden. Where they've been indoctrinated by this for 400 years, mm. their music was reflective of that indoctrination. The confusion of the poor, upper middle class, white, gay director of programming who works for One Extra the position that he's been put in, you know, like he has my sympathy. Do you get what I'm saying? Because he's the guy who has yeah. to now um, comb through all of this music to see which is fit for him and which isn't fit for him. Mm. But how is he a representation of the demographic of the fan base? Mm. 
I totally and utterly feel you. So um, music today is still being, um, I've, I've got to speak up the thing. Music yeah. <laughs> today is still being run by an agenda of yeah. which they wish to promote. I've never heard Immortal Technique being played on a daytime ro radio broadcast. No. I've never heard Dead Prez being played on a daytime radio broadcast. No. Um, there's so many revolutionary... Bob rap. Villain, old type Bob oh, Villain. Yes, Bob yeah. Villain. Cold. So there's, Cold. there's so many people that we know that we're not going to get to hear on daytime radio because it plays to an agenda. Mm. What has come to our attention and what has come to light of recent years is that the major corporation shareholders of the largest record company industries and distribution of music have also heavily invested in the prison system of human custody being a profitable um, free labor mm. Um, business mm. and where their money was heavily invested in mm. the custody of humans they also at the same time for if they can promote an agenda of things that would lead the fans of rap music to criminality, yeah. criminality yeah. then this is the agenda that they wish to push because it's going to increase their profits and what they've invested in human custody so Ooh, that's cold. imagine you got the big boss at the top who's like play the kids the evil music so they grow up evil so then i can have a reason to lock them up blatantly so when we look American at radio also. programming yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, worldwide yeah. when we look at radio programming and the controlling of the youth's minds mm. through radio programming through television programming keeps them locked in keeps them locked in yeah. keeps them dumbed down yeah. keeps them ignorant keeps them misogynistic mm -hmm. keeps them Egotistical. Egotistical. Yeah. Keeps them aspiring for things that are way beyond their financial expectation. Mm. Um, and the noisy yeah. ones, the noisy rappers that do proclaim to be and entertain the thing, they're getting paid. Yeah. yeah, yeah. In the shade. And yes. sponsorship. Yep. Yeah. So they don't have to put their hand in their pocket a lot of no. the time. One person said to me something that resonated is with the American dream. It's called the American dream because you'd have to be asleep to believe in it, <laughs> you know. And, um, <laughs> but a lot of our youth are walking around consciously awake, fully believing in this American dream. Yeah, mm. Mm. which is really not. It's an fact. illusion because they can't hear any, anything else being fed to them. Yeah, yeah. nothing else is being fed yeah. to them. They're, 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 they're being they're, funnel fed. Yeah, rubbish yeah. food with no vegetables, no five a day. No. You know, so. so everything is Mackey's when when the good green juice is over here, but mm. you're not going to get to hear it. No, that's no, right. Just not. Same with the music. Music's mm. extremely powerful. Mm. Like you say, it's a weapon. Mm. It's a weapon. And when... But it's a key. It's, it's a, a tool. It's tool. a tool. Yeah. It's yeah. a lot of things, isn't it, to a lot of people. And well, it's a tool. So whether you use that tool as a weapon, whether you use that tool as an instrument of love, mm. whether you use that tool as an instrument of unification, you can use that tool as an instrument of understanding, mm. of compassion. Mm. You could also use that tool as an instrument of hate. Mm. You know, it's speech. But um, it can be escapism. It's that house. Why well, I love house music. It's, like yeah. you it's whatever. There's yeah, no yeah. language barrier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's dance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it is. I feel it's dance. you. I feel you. Alternatively, yeah. I never wanted to escape, so I hate house. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you know? But you know house inside but out, don't you? I know house. Yeah, I know yeah. house. Yeah, we yeah. were acid house kids, weren't we? Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You just yeah. brought me back. Well, I said <laughs> it, it. There's a revolution to be had. Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually, while we're on the subject of musical <laughs> genres and whatnot, because let's be real now, yeah. right? We need to raise a, a, a glass and salute. Chaz and Dave. Oh, it definitely, uh, yes. definitely, definitely. Um, because one of them has passed away. The one of them has passed yeah. away. Right, so... I'll raise my cup of tea. Uh, Chaz well, and Dave. then let me say this. Because we... I'm, oh, hold on one mm. second. Because we are of the belief, all three of us are of the belief that Chaz and Dave were the first Oh, MCs. definitely, definitely. definitely. The first, they were definitely. the first MCs. Definitely, definitely. You I, came I would like to just say, <laughs> for Chaz and Dave to have lost one member, yeah? Mm. That's like mud... Mm. I yeah. know yeah. he doesn't want to live putting me in the dirt. No. And I don't ever want to live putting him in the dirt. Mm. So for the surviving member of Chaz and Dave, you've got all of our sympathy, mm. compassion, yes. condolences yes. and love. Yes. yes. Now let's talk about them musically. Ooh, what? What? Bad boy rappers from Dave <laughs> Dot. What are you <laughs> ramping with, fam? No, even, even, even when they were both versing at the same time, different bits of the song at the same time. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. At the same do. time. Like, yeah. so it becomes percussive. And live yeah. as well. Percussive. No fucking around. There's, and, one, there's one of them and there's subject live in the pub. Like, and there's subject matter. Bad. Crazy. I mean, them playing yeah. in the pub on the keyboard is the same essence mm. as like me and Mono freestyling yeah. on the back of the bus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. same principles. Same yeah. principles, same essence. And uh, it's just that 
We had to look up. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. Come down here. Got my on the side. I'm sort out. Come down here. Come down here. That's that's how good. Yeah. We can actually recognise that today as hardcore drill. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Let's be real. Yeah. That's hardcore drill. Yeah. And, with uh, instruments. Yes. With instruments. Call and return. Call and response. Mm. Okay. Hooks, hooks, hooks. I always uh, used to love the drummer with the big cigar. And now you just think you're, he was, you literally looked like you just dragged him out of an Irish <laughs> pub. You know what I mean? <laughs> I love that. It's been brought to their attention yeah. how we herald them mm. and how much mm. we love them. And I know that they were happy about our take on why we think that they're the first ever British rap outfit uh, before, <laughs> P- before PJ and Duncan. Um, <laughs> so I know that um, we've been able to transcend our messages of um, appreciation yeah. to them. Both. Love and gratitude yeah. always, yeah. yeah. Um, time too. But yeah, I think that there was a period for us where we had to look at what we recognised as rapping outside of hip hop, and this was a, a very Ian infantry. Jury straight for me. Oh, Ian, Ian Jury, Jury. Oh. for me, Ian Jury, Jury. is Boy. the epitome of if they if you, I don't use the word UK rap because it sounds like you crap, yeah, like UK rap or British hip hop. Stop, you can't yeah, 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 say yeah, yeah. it's ours. It's just everyone's. It's, it's hip hop, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. But for me, if there's ever anything you want to say, what's the first UK rap hip hop? To me, it's Ian Jury. Yeah, all day. Like, You're right. Where myself, I was, where, where yeah, yeah. myself, I was totally engrossed by the dagger, like the braggadocio rap skills, presence, essence, and aura of Muhammad Ali outside oh, the ring. Yeah. Oh, outside yeah, the yeah, ring, yeah, yeah, yeah. bravado, Ro- yeah. God, the best yeah. rapper ever. Like <laughs> what the be- I mean, I'm there going, who can rap like this guy? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know. So I mean, we all get our influence. So we mm. was looking for where's our inspiration yeah, of, yeah. of what we recognise to be rapping outside of hip hop, mm. and it was vast. Mm. And it Bob Monkhouse can freestyle like a bastard. Yo, you know? Bob Monkhouse. <laughs> You know, hey. Don't sleep on Bob Monkhaus. No, but if Bob you don't Monkhaus know about Bob Monkhaus, you talk about the whole Comedian. audience, all of the stars. Yeah. Yeah. On, 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 the on the spot, off at the top of the head. On the spot, off at the top of the head, freestyle. Les Dawson, comedian with the piano that <laughs> used to play <laughs> out of tune yeah, yeah. while singing. <laughs> <and> <laughs> More doing it, doing it, doing it, yeah, it is. Um, I think artists, rappers, especially young rappers, I don't think they actually realise the power of rap, the frontal cortex and how how it's so easily captured. Mm, mm, you mm. capture people in a moment. Yeah. And and that's what the powers that be are frightened of. Yes, mm. of course it is. It's the power mm. of the revolution. Yeah. Mm. It really is the power of the revolution. I mean, if we used to look at the industry and the market again, I know lots of people think to themselves... How can I get my talent mm. outside of my immediate bedroom to the world, to the mm. fans, get, gain a fan base, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I think with trying to get music out, a lot of people seem to want to turn to the majors so they're willing to um, almost compromise their integrity yeah. for the limelight. Yeah. Um, that can be dangerous. Mm. See, art artistic integrity has always been driven by how we feel mm. and it could never be compromised, bought or sold. Mm. So we're very powerful in the integrity that we feel about our passion for music and, and how music can be revolutionary and change people. I think if we look at what have been cornerstone changes for cementing how me and Mono felt would have been at a time when hip hop was being fully embraced we're recognising it outside the spectrum of hip-hop, like Wordsworth and Kipling, etc. Benjamin Zephaniah. Benjamin Zephaniah, absolutely, yeah, uh, who, who we grew up as a big fan of. Yeah. Um, so watching all of these people bring what they was bringing to the table, when you say the power of music, whilst we was definitely absorbing a certain amount of consciousness where we was driven towards truth-seeking, mm. all of a sudden we heard... Yes, the rhythm, the rebel. Uh, And we was like, what? What? Noise and rebellion. Rebellion sound, rebel sound, bomb squad. It was the anarchist punk movement in our generation, in our culture, in our movement of hip hop. And it resonated like, Man, it resonated like a fish to water with me and Mongo. And then mm-hmm. it was like, we've got to hear more of these artists. Mm-hmm. What they're called, they're called the public's enemy. Oh, you know? <laughs> What's that album called? 
uh, Bomb Rush the Show, yeah, was it? Yeah. Uh, songs like My Uzi Ways a Ton. Mm. You see these car keys, Night you never get these. Bass heads. Like, the man, the revolution, the message, the yeah. security of the first world, Flavor mm. Flav being mm. like the courthouse jester of, mm. The, mm. of the king's speech, being Chuck D it brought to you so powerful and... Combination. And the combination of it all. It was just what we needed when we needed it. We had been listening to the Poor Righteous Teachers. Mm -hmm. And that was our vibe. It was like, yeah, them and I are on our wave. Mm -hmm. you know? But when Public but Enemy when came out, you know, the KRSs and all that, they were on our wave because mm -hmm. we was living it as they were talking yeah. it. Um, but when Public Enemy came out, we was like, that's our calling. Mm -hmm. KRS brought the reggae thing into play. Yeah, not only that, he, I, I feel that him... That, just that. Sorry, I was about to spit on your floor when saying his name. <laughs> but what I feel was... The poetics that like he brought, poeticism, um, and he opened up not yeah. just rap. It's not just really rap, rap. It's not. It's just like something yeah. else. And he was one of the first like lyrical like let's cons or whatever. You know, mm. he would bring in words that no one's. It's like what what education? Just how Papoose did with his law libraries, and like he would open mm. up things. You know what I'm saying? <gasps> Can I say? Yeah. I'd like to interject that where he pointed out the reggae element of mm. KRS One's work, which he could hear those blatant yeah, yeah, undertones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of things I'd like to say here. Obviously, I've said it before and I'll say it again, we identified with hip-hop immediately because it was birthed out of the reggae sound yeah, system yeah, 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 yeah. that we felt we had a claim to in England go. more than anywhere else yeah, yeah, yeah. outside of Jamaica. Yeah, 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 yeah. Old so hip-hop was ultimately ours. Old ragged uh, twins, tip -rivery. People of the hip-hop genre after Cool Herc yeah. wouldn't recognise the I-Roys, the U-Roys, mm -hmm. the... Um, but they'd get it on a second wave through hip-hop. Yeah, yeah. So, but the second wave didn't know the rooted foundation yeah. of, of mm. who were the first mm. rapping MCs, mm. which was the Iroys, the U-Roys, right. the Lieutenant Stitches, mm. the... Papa Sons and the... Yeah, and um, so we was very versed in that. So when hip-hop was evolving in its very infantry stages, we would thrive to seek music that had that element of reggae yeah, spice in that. it. I remember there was I a tune... You. Um, why are you scratching at the record? Just easy pops. I'm just mixing the cool reggae with the massive hip hop. So we was thriving to hear elements of reggae yeah. in our in everything. In everything. Even in acid, scacid, yeah. scar and acid, they mixed it up. So Whatever it was. So I mean, we even came from an element that before rapping, we had been brought to our attention of toasting and chanting mm. yeah. on the microphone sound systems before we was ever brought to our attention about hip-hop. Mm -hmm. So we was we was birthed and rooted and grounded mm. in the foundations of dance hall before hip-hop came to us. Mm. Mm. So it was a natural transition for us to understand from Latin to English. But even like, I yeah. think, I think dan dance hall clashes in itself and things like that is like one of the biggest shows you're ever going to get. Okay. Just from we heard yeah. it on tape and then we start, we'll see it on video, it's like, I, I would love to have like, seen that. You know? They just, attended, yeah. yeah. Crazy. I would have loved to have just been in that. Engrossed in it. Oh, yeah. Mate. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. I think I would have liked to have been a teenager in the 60s. Mm -hmm. You know, the Motown era, mm -hmm. the Isaac Hayes. Oh, the, yeah. With like, the, if, if with the suit, kind of pre-mod kind yeah, of look. Yeah, yeah. I'm kind of like, a, I don't know, I might have been totally shagadelic, but, um, <laughs> but I know that... I love what I hear of the Motown era. I think that towards the ending of the 60s, throughout the 70s, was when instrumentalists, composers and musicians and vocalists mm. had reached their pinnacle of their skill Ooh. just before it turned into the synthetic digital revolution yeah. mm. switchover. I'm going to hand it to you, I agree. So I believe that's why hip-hop... Um, always looked back to sample some of that great instrumentation that mm, had reached yeah, its pinnacle. The pinnacle. Um, people like, yeah, yeah um, you know, um, who was the guy who produced for Michael Jackson? Quincy Jones. Quincy Jones, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. And, and, you know, mm. like that whole um, uh, Barry Gordy. Yeah. Barry Gordy. Phil Spector? Yes. Mm. You know, and... and uh, and then came Craftwork, mm. which blew us out the water. water. So, um, I mean, oh, we, we, transi we transitioned we from hip-hop, I mean, music being at the pinnacle of instrumental, mm. you know, um, vocalists being at the pinnacle of their skill. And then it all turned into, what the hell is this? Because mm. it was banging. Yeah. It was Craftwork. It was digital. It was Flipped synthetic. It on oh, but, um, Cats as well. My man, uh, what's his name? Thingy Cats. Uh, din -da -da, din -da -da. Mm -hmm. What's his name? Bernard Cats, what's his name? Oh, my God. Um, uh, is it Cats? It's Tour de France. Cats. Yeah, yeah, Tour de France. No, no, Tour de France is Kraftwerk, but Din Dada 
is something cats. What's his name? K A T Z. Answers on the comments below. Mm -hmm. No deal. Yeah. Digging in the crates crew. Mm, yeah, exactly. Watch the video man. for that as well. That didn't data. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll get it up on the screen. Um, I'm very mindful of the time and how you boys are getting on at the moment because uh, <laughs> you, these guys are they're, they're active. They're, they're constantly busy, constantly moving. I mean, you're going to see K Coke in a bit, aren't you? People to see, places to go. Yeah, yeah. big up to K Coke. You done though? Yeah. Just keeping it moving. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and Mongo man, like I see you're a. You're a creative vessel. Every time I see you, you're doing something. If it's not making beats, it's creative. I can't, I can't shake it. It's the good germ, isn't it? It's like it's, I have to do something. Uh, I what I love about your your bars, Mo, is I love to. I love the. There's a tongue and cheek. There's a there's a real appreciation for a good pun, <laughs> and there's a real appreciation for getting into something and making you think differently about it. Whether it's a word, mm -hmm. a situation, a phrase you knew, and you've just switched flipped. You, you're constantly running. It feels like to me you're constantly in it. Constantly I running things that through he his head. He has the dark satirical humour yes. that people are scared to speak. <laughs> And he just blurts it out like he, he didn't even think out. about it. So, yeah, I, I, that's why I love it. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. messing with words is... Uh, 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 like my mum would say, Mono, you're just words, words, words again. Like, it's just... I found that words, the sound of words, and being around the words made me be impound the words mm. and ground the words in the mud. Yeah, yeah, and I was yeah. I had to fuck with the words. The words, just, just, ah, words, words, words. Your That's, voice, though, as well, bro. Like, but, your voice is just... You, you know what your voice reminds me of? Mm. Reminds me of... I don't think you'll be offended me saying this. Like a, a rockabilly vocalist sometimes. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> Get me out of here. Yeah, look, can, re -stick your sellotape on I your I table elaborate. later. Can I, funny that my mum's... My mum, I had to learn to drive off my mum. Yeah. We used to drive together. Can I school elaborate school. about words... Slang yeah. and culture, language, slang, and, and accents. Yes, right? he says in his finest Leeds accent. Of course, yeah. hey up, lad. <laughs> now, me and Mongo are from up north. I'm we're, a Nottingham head. We're both from born up in north. Manchester. No. Lived in Sheffield. Why? Came to London when I was seven. I didn't know that. Of a Bangladeshi background. A Bangladeshi, English, and Pakistani. Yeah. Mud. I'm. Mud. I'm a Yorkshire boy of Scottish and Cumbrian heritage. Mm very well engrossed in my Scottish and Cumbrian culture and heritage. Wow. Cumberland sausages and square sausages. <laughs> What's the battle? Um, <laughs> Saw sausages. Yeah. Chen Tan. Um, <laughs> so what I'm saying is I grew up in Leeds. Mm. He grew up in Knox. And we came to London at the same age. Mm. Now, Damn. having to adapt and apply with the power of words and realisation of what we can do with words, we had to adapt from our northern accents into a London twang. And at the time when we came to London, we was adopting to London twang. There was the good old Cockney accent. Mm. There, you know what I mean, mate? Rhyme, slang, apples and pears. You mm. Give More it a words. large, yeah. you lemon and all of that, yeah? <laughs> and we kind of had to adapt to these words, slang and culture. Mm. And at the same time, there was being birthed a second generation and third generation immigration, urban, London New yeah, kind of identity yeah. of language. <laughs> new yeah, yeah, new kind of identity city, of ghetto. language. And it was in yeah, the right. city, the ghetto, mm. urban. Yeah, well, Demographically, I'm saying it right. Yeah. And um, so then you would have an uh, Asian kid, a white kid, a Chinese kid, a black kid, a Turkish kid, all Speaking growing up on Andover Estate, yeah. greeting each other, saying, mm. well, go on, well, fam, well, which yeah. is very much Jamaican well, patois. Very Jamaican, yeah. um, I think the very the Jamaican patois, as well as the music, has been very influential mm. on mm. the London street. See, this was a time, there was a time people would say, don't talk black, you're talking black, he's talking black. Mm. Yeah, and it was like, mm. what are you talking about? Like, and then mm. it crossed over to, wait, yeah. everybody has one language here, you're the odd one out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right because you're thinking yeah. a particular way about you're it. You're talking yeah. black. Yeah, you're talking black. He's right. talking black. He's mad. So I had, to yeah. th I had to think, so if I was brought up in France and I was speaking French, would I be talking black? Like, so the black French boy, is he talking black or is he talking French? Like, we had to deal with all of this. But one time when me and Mono can say, and I'm, I'm speaking for both of us again, we're twins, we're connected, was when we went to court. And we heard the barrister and the judge talking for the first Lyrics time. Yeah. We was intrigued by the We've poetry. Got to learn some legalese now. You yeah. Thought, yeah, really. We, yeah, were, new we, new we was totally intrigued by the language of yeah. legalese. Mm -hmm. We was like, they're speaking English, and yeah. we didn't understand. Yeah, we learned that some maritime law, some common like, law. Yeah, Mono, yeah. Mono, we was both just sat in the dock. They were both speaking English to each other. 
What did he say, fam? <laughs> I, I, was I, was I was getting five percent. I was getting five percent. I like, yo, right. I know that bit didn't sound good. So yeah. <laughs> we was even more intrigued by language. You have to realize that our journey was coming from that of coming from north to south, yeah. and and the demographic of you speak black and you don't speak black mm, and this yeah, and that, yeah. right? I, I, and how do you feel when you're told that? Like, you speak black. No, I don't. Because <laughs> yeah, you guys are from up north anyway. Maybe, you're listening, maybe you're listening as, as a colour. Maybe you're yeah. listening with racial ears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are racist. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, which is what's the truth. There is a racist. Uh, so, I know that when we first both stood in the dock, as, as um, many a misspent youth, many a time we both stood in the dock, like, I know from the first time, we was both like, oh, it was like more having, language. It was like having a taste of a drug mm -hmm. because uh, we stood in court and I was like, what was he talking about? I don't know. Mm -hmm. And we was like, rah, we have to learn what they're talking about. <laughs> Let's come back here. Yeah. Cause, cause, cause we we got to come yeah, back here. <laughs> no, because our fate depends upon whatever yeah. they were saying. And I want to know ahead of time. Uh, yeah. We're standing mm -hmm. in the dock. Whatever they're saying, our fate depends upon mm -hmm. it. And yeah. I think we just want to know. <laughs> you know, like, and it's all in the language of legalese. So then we was intrigued by language. Mm -hmm. um, Language, mannerism, body language, everything. Uh, you know, we, we went everywhere. We went down conspiracy places. We went went over to Zed York, Malachi. We went over to, hmm. uh, went everywhere, you know, Masonics. We went everywhere to try and find out more. Just more. We need hmm. more. Yeah. I, I can say that with him saying that, to this I will say, we was very privileged as children in the area of our demograph. The reason that we was very privileged is because we was privy to certain information, insight and enlightenment that our elders in our immediate demographic took it upon themselves to teach us yeah, yeah, yeah. and let us have that knowledge at our disposal. Yeah, 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 yeah. So me and Mono can say that we're very grateful to being privy to teachings that are, how would I describe it, teachings that are forbidden. Mm. Yeah. You know, um forbidden hidden lost languages, yeah. Yeah, mm. uh, so so I mean, people have gone back to some of the stuff that we was rapping about as children and going, that's what's going on today. Mm. And it's not that we had we didn't have a, any insight, insight or we, vision. We, We're not yeah, Nostradamus no, no. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. We didn't we weren't looking for a crystal ball. Mm -hmm. We was very lucky to be privileged to be given insight to information that was for a select few. Mm. Um, that people felt that the public wasn't ready for. I was accused by all of my peers of being the guy who's gone crazy smoking too much weed and I've become the conspiracy theorist. And that was around 1994, 95. That, that's kind of just interject there because this is an interesting topic because there has been that that's gone on throughout. And, and what's your take on that? On on people thinking, you know, the conspiracy theories that you, the weed's got to your head and you're going cuckoo at certain junctures of your life because you're, you're not. And I've never known you to be, but, but there's this, whether it's a promoter or it's a punter, there's this kind of ever-going worry for you at right. times. you know what I mean? I realised that being given such information and trying to explain such in-depth woven deceit to the common man that happens in society was too much for him to bear one. Cognitive dissidence would kick in too. Mm. Um, so I had to learn myself that I've come from a place where he was and I've elevated to a place of my overstanding of certain infrastructure within society. Mm. Rather than me get frustrated, I can always come back down to the level where he is. Mm. Give him spoon-fed insight to bring him up a little bit, even though I may be a scholar here. Mm. It's like if someone can speak French and they've got an A-level in French and they wish to teach you French, they've got to start teaching you somewhere yeah, yeah. with your bonjour yeah, and your... The seed, yeah. So this is how I thought. It, it, it's, it's funny. You, you went too far on people. A yeah. Times, <laughs> and, um, That's why it sounded like madness. So yeah. here, here was my frustration, and I'll speak my frustration on this podcast. Thank my you. frustration was that my peers who I love, who I check with every day, 
kind of started being like, don't invite Skinny around to the party because mm. he's going to want to talk about UFOs. <laughs> and he's going to want to talk about chariots of the gods. He's going to want to talk about Vendinik and, and all these things that scientists can't explain. He's going to want to talk about um, vibration and magnetic energy. He's going to mm. want to talk about Nikola Tesla. He's going to want to talk about the magnetic energy just above our atmosphere that's free to tap into. Mm. He's going to want to talk about the all of the megalithic structures are actually computer generating um, boards of energy whether you go to South America, England, um, Egypt, all over the world, all these megaliths are in line. Is your mind blown yet? Is so, your mind so blown? with me starting talking about all oh, these yeah. things, um, started talking about bloodlines of dynasties who have ruled over the population of the human um, race from the beginnings of the Egyptian days with obviously... Yeah the recordings of Pharaoh set my people free from Moses. We know that there's an oppressive regime going on. So who's the beneficiary of the oppressive regime of Pharaoh let my people go? So given that we can understand that from the days of the pyramids, we know that people were being yeah. oppressed by a regime. Yeah. Where did that regime Clearly. go? That regime, I followed the path, which became um, from Egypt to Mesopotamia to Babylonia, to Greece, to Rome, to Britain. Jeez. To America. Damn. Uh, yeah, now America. Uh, yeah. And I was like, how did this become of? Wow. Because families realise that at infantry stage how gullible human can be and um, they'll give them the idealisms of religion. Mm. And if they don't follow the idealisms of religion, they'll build an army to enforce law. So it doesn't matter that you've now woken up to our false idealisms of religion. We've already got a war. We now have an army and a police force to, to enforce get, yeah. our regime of tax to pay to Pharaoh. Um, this is such a great hustle. Why would they ever want to give it up? That's why the 10% have become the 1% and they remain the 1% of the elite. Mm. Um, these were the overstandings that I had as a young teenager trying to explain that to the common man was too much for him to grasp, like mm. I said, and the incognitant dissidents would kick in and stuff. So I found that in my frustrations, I found myself what I would call dumbing it down mm. for the common man mm -hmm. to understand and try to raise him up with a little bit of spoon-fed. If he was to ask me what council estate of mind was, I overstood the bigger demograph of why people had a council of state of mind. Mm. What I was explaining to people with the council of state of mind as to why they had that council of state of mind so it could help them and spoon feed them to lift them up outside of the realm of the demograph mm. so that they could understand it better. Now, when we look at world economy, the elite ruling mm. family dynasties who wish to remain in their position, for me to come out and start talking all about that, my own friends at the age of 14, 15 wouldn't invite me to the party because they thought I had gone. Um, I will also say that throughout mine and Mono's childhood, we've been subjected to Psycho the Rapists. Yeah. Uh, when I Just was, for bunking off school. When I was nine, I was first subjected to Psycho the Rapist, and that's when you first get to break down the, um, the word when you sit outside the office. Explain been, Psycho the Rapist. Uh, you've been sent to... Um, they can't quite put you down as a bad kid, but they mm. don't understand you, so they send you to child psychotherapy to, right. to have you... Mm. Um, assess, 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 yeah, and all that, yeah. And um, Ewo even remembers <laughs> it. Pussy, we're ass. And um, so I'd be like, oh my God, I better buck up my ideas and mm. act like I'm a normal kid. Yeah. Yes. How do you do that? What's I like that? to play football. <laughs> I yeah. like girls. I'm happy. Yeah, I do yeah. my work. I, yeah, like I'll do anything you say. I'm, I'm not chippy a, later. No problems. I'm not a nutter. Yeah. They'll be showing you shadows of some guy shanking a woman in the alley, asking you, "What do you see? Pretty butterflies." <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's pretty butterflies. What do I see? Pretty wow. butterflies. To uh, I'm at the beach. <laughs> yeah, I'm on the beach. <laughs> yeah, right. I was first subjected to this when I was nine. By the time I was ten, they went. Now we need a second opinion. They sent me again. By the time I was 11, I was sent to the new one by Alpha and Estate. Well, this is when I met him, like about them times there, and I bunked off school. I went to uh, George Orwell School for about two months, three months, and then I bunked off just outside. We would bunk off outside school, just literally across the road. Can I tell all? <laughs> wait, oh, wait, wait, I'll tell you. And, um, tell and you. then, because I was bunking off, and my brother was bunking off, <laughs> and my brother is schizophrenic, oh, they offered a the place Sag to Sag. They offered him a Ninja place Sag. in... Simmons House, right? Woodside Hospital. They said, hey, uh, you can have a place up there. And he went, no, fuck it. And now I said, may I pause you? Wait. No, wait, no. Wait, wait, wait. I, I want you to explain <laughs> to the people at home watching this exactly <laughs> what Simmons House is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Simmons House is a psychiatric adolescent unit 
for supposedly troubled teens yeah. or anyone they wanted to put in there that wasn't conforming. Can you now tell me how old it is? How long it's been established? It's fucking hundreds of years. I don't even know. The building, oh, wow. the building is old. Years. It's got. A, it's even got its own telescopic observatory in there. Did they used to do shock therapy on the children? Not that I saw, but I believe so because there's other no, wards along there. No Harris did shock oh. therapy on the children. Yeah, yeah not in the time That's when I was fucked. there. But they do have like very old wings of the hospital that I, I wouldn't walk along. Was you speaking to the voice in the cupboard? Yes. Do you know who the voice in the cupboard was? <laughs> there's my skeleton in my cupboard. Yeah, it's skeleton in the closet, right? So I went there because I had nothing better to do. They were like, yeah, we can even go in. <laughs> I had like, nothing better to do. I had nothing better to do. Then go to the children's nut house. Nut house, right? So I went right, to this I'm, place, right? Listen, you're listen, getting this on your podcast. <laughs> now. Listen, I had nothing better to do. We was bunking off. We were stealing shit, shoplifting clothes, shoplifting anything we wanted. Uh, and Fresh I went to this unit. Every day. And in this unit, I met a, a girl um, who there was nothing wrong with her at all, except for... She used to be a, she was like 16, she used to be a brass for judges, yeah? Um, she was a victim of a child sexual syndicate. Quite possibly, quite possibly. Wow. I met go in there and uh, what happened was, in there, I would stay in there, I, I went to, I think they said, uh, we can offer you a residential place. I went, fuck it, why not? I can come in and come and go as I please. I used to come in and out the window. I'd use it as a camp. Uh, and then... Skunga would come. Beautiful building, into, beautiful Edwardian structure. It was a freaky building. Oh, and he would wow. come and he would stay overnight whenever he wanted in the closet. I'd climb in, the in cupboard. and I'd, so, I'd climb up to this really <laughs> high cupboard that <laughs> nobody could possibly you climb You can't get up there. I remember, and he'd sleep in there. Uh, yeah. We'd roll a spliff each. Yep. And um, so One time each, we never had a lighter. One so time we, we, roll, we rolled hash with just the flick of a flint. What? Yeah. We were, yeah we and we lit it flint, off a yeah. flint. We, yeah. we lit it by putting loads of flint in a Rizzler. And then flint in that up and it goes, and then you can like another rizzle off that. That's incredible. Genius. So while so I was taking up that time. Doing, no, but can yeah, I just say, on. whilst we was doing that, the nice staff would come round to, to monitor Mono's mental behaviour. And so they'd get to his door and they'd be like, all night he's talking to the cupboard. <laughs> <laughs> Increase his dose. But I know, no, no, they, they never got increase no, 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 this young man. They never, they never gave any. <laughs> you're wake up. I never got any juice. And the thing is, my brother did get <laughs> juice. Yeah. And the chips. No. They're the only saying the power of podcast <laughs> <Yeah>. right here. <laughs> tell them about the juice. I never got juice. You fucker. You got no, juice. But tell them about the juice. What juice is? All right. So in this building, it's not they, a mongo. <laughs> yeah, it's not a mongo. Uh, juice is uh, juice, juice is juice. liquid. <laughs> you're still juiced. Li so juice so is <laughs> liquid. Kosh, like a liquid thing to dumb you the fuck down. No laughing Sometimes to, to make sure you can't get... <laughs> yeah, in prison, they should do it in the tea bags. Put it in there. Nah, uh, yeah. really? Yeah, to make people not get a shud dung dung Yeah, because they don't want a load of like... If you ever get liquid kosh... Yeah, yeah, if you ever get liquid kosh wow. more... If you ever get liquid kosh more than twice, we've lost you. Really? Yeah. I love well, you. Yeah, yeah. Many of our friends happen to. I love like, you. And get I love bloated. you all. They'd, I love you all. They get bloated uh, for it and then they do the shuffle. My brothers, uh, because I took his place and had a laugh and, and I wasn't, there was nothing wrong with me. I was in and out of that building within a summer. But my brother went totally schizophrenic, uh, enjoyed microdots, black ones, blotters, red ones, um, all kinds of like acid. We were experimenting, but he did we the experiment. Were. He went in mm. like, and um, he never really came back. But... Um, is it my fault he went nuts? No, it fucking ain't. But um, it was a good time. Like, you know what Schiz I mean? There was nothing to do. We were nicking cars. Schizophrenia is a health condition, where, man. Mm. Where we were, there was like loads of fast cars. We would steal Sierra Cosworth's, me, uh, you, Lakey. Calibre 16 Lake. valve 4x4. Four four. Catch me doing Six, donuts yeah. around the... 16 Jeez. valve... Um, <laughs> G GTI's uh, fucking Astras that we when we was bored yeah. we'd ram the police for a chase because yeah. yeah. we were <laughs> popping love doves Jesus. popping love doves doing 120 like yeah. I, I'd like to say that through our experiences of being around the demographic of the children's homes and the uh, mental people's homes we were first hand aware to how much um, abuse was going on Especially in the children's homes. At the hands of the children's homes, at the hands of foster yeah. parents, at the hands of young mental institutions, yeah. at the hands Chairs, of yeah. um, young, um, like, young prisons, Simmons House, um, Latchmere, Latchmere House, House um, Stamford House, Stamford House, and all of these places. Yeah. Like, what these children were enduring, they're our age today, mm. and, and they were broken then. Don't expect them to not be... Shame Do you understand? So we were subjected to, yeah. uh, me and Mono can tell you over a million 
first-hand stories. Of... Look, a lot of people went from Highbury, where we were, a lot of people went from those children's homes and they were taken in minibuses to the Isle of Jersey, yeah, which is a tax haven. Guernsey. Right? Guernsey mm. and Cornwall. Jersey. Where you go, yeah, they never Isle come back. Isle of White. You need to see someone called uh, Bill Maloney. Uh, is it Bill Maloney? And he's uh, he's got a film company called um, Pie and Mash Films. He has a film called Sun, Sea and Satan. And it shows you where they used to steal the children. And uh, Jimmy fucking Savile used to go up there to the nut house over in uh, the Isle of Jersey where the children they stole from is there. So as children, uh, yeah. we was watching these children. Gone. First, so, first so, hand, gone. yeah. Did he get adopted? You were seeing them off. Yeah, yeah. Were and they weren't yeah. getting adopted or fostered. They, wow. they Yeah, they were, they were being stolen, yeah. The yeah. evil that men do. This is the, yeah. The, yeah. This yeah. country, man. Rest the floor, man. Secret shenanigans yeah. of the dark kind. Yeah. So we were exposed to a lot as children, um, and and that whole are we are we mad? <laughs> are we mad? Um, no, nothing we were, wrong with me. We we were we were just clearly looking for sanity in this mad world. Being, being accused of being navel gazers, a navel gazer. I'm smoking weed too. What's that? What's that? Oh, it's a belly button, motherfucker. I don't need that. <laughs> so, so the whole dumbing yeah. it down thing, yeah. I think by the time I um, brought counts to the state of mind, that was me dumbing it down. Resonated. Yeah, like, like, yeah, because I wanted to, to resonate with yeah. my people. Yeah. And I thought if I start talking about stuff that they're not ready to handle. Yeah. But um, people come up to us now and they talk about the subject matter of our freestyles from the early 90s. Mm. And then like, everything that you was rapping about is everything that we're going through today. Mm. And everything you mentioned, I can't remember. Like, the, half the time, it's like, I was very liquidated, you know? Like, but I, I know it, there's some goodness there. That's mm. why there's tapes floating around um, of like everything we, we used to do. Like, and there's some, there's the original things. You know what, there's songs like the original, um, the original, uh, what's it called? Fucking Red Sonja. The original, uh, what, the, yeah, what, Red Sonja. Yeah, Red um, Unknown Dangers, the original Unknown Dangers by Chester P. Hackenbush is uh, Angel Face Terror. That song there is what birthed a whole, a whole fucking chasm of rappers there and styles. Go. Yeah, but you will never hear the original version, even the version he brought out on the on the past that new uh, album. It's not the one. He's got it. He's not letting you have it. But that is the key. That is the key. I mean, um, wow. Lady, Lady Heroin was put out, which was always a personal tune that was never meant for the public. Yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. I think somebody called Shinobi, <laughs> who was suffering with problems of alcoholism, mm. just got a bit overly excited and released it from his laptop. Mm. Okay. So the world has it now. Mm. Um, I've had good feedback from it, but it was a personal story, but it was never for the public. Mm. You know, some things like mm. that. Yeah, these things happen. Rappers have this tendency, and in, in all the best possible ways, to hold their heart on their sleeve and go in and say what they think. Yeah, and not all of them. I think Only the ones I want to listen to now and then. That's what, <laughs> that's what I'm kind of getting at, because if you really open that door and let that be the, mm. be the, the, the vehicle that allows you to express, mm. that's what's making it the, the new age punk. That's what yeah, makes yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'd like to think that in today's day and age with the digital revolution, that it's an open market platform for all audience and mm. all musicians and expressing expression alike um although i'd be a fool to try to tell you that there isn't still a regime with a dark hand in place yes the, there is the shadow yeah, puppets is, they still have question. an agenda for that question they they pick their they pick their cherries and they keep them and they nurture them and they, they sort of let people have their heroes yeah but, you know it's we're just, alive though we're mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. just what i'm coming to we're alive we're, they see what i tell you something right now okay go on for some time me and skinny didn't talk to each other we could meet at any one stage and be the same, but we didn't, mm. right? The love we have as brothers never died. No, it will never he, change. There could be anger, di disassociation. Didn't I kept meeting him at funerals. <laughs> and I said, you know, I can't meet you at funerals anymore. Mm -hmm. We have to mend something. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we mended it. Mm -hmm. 15 years we didn't speak for. Yeah, mm -hmm. We had to mend it. I'm tired over, of seeing Over go, the like, most minor ego thing. Mm. What? <laughs> Does it matter? It's none of your fucking business. Damn. <laughs> That's uh, for the next episode. And it's two o'clock. No, and we're gonna go. Like... A shiny red bike. <laughs> it were over a shiny red shiny bike. Shiny red fucking bike. <laughs> two little boys had two little <laughs> toys. <laughs> Mama saw but not only shiny red bike. <laughs> it was infiltration of mud. And I will tell you one thing. Um, this is what we learned from Michael Evis. Yeah, he had to let the land rest at Glastonbury because the cows that he put on there, the shit and the mud mixed and made E. coli. Mm. When there's shit in the mud, fam, there is this ease. Mm. This E's being the disease. Yeah. yeah. So E. coli, right? Mm. Mm. 
So oh, we, we, we have to more. filter. This, e e this ease is mucus. Yeah. All That's this right. ease is ninety percent mucus base. Eradicate <laughs> all mucus from your electric vessel. Yeah. And get alkaline. Yeah, there you go. Who's rapping by that? Mm. Exactly. Yeah. I think, I think, I think, I'm hope I'm thinking and then, I mean, I could go on forever. No, this is it. This is it. This, this is, is what you get. We've, we've wrapped up. <laughs> this is one of the first. One of the first. Of one many, of many. This is a mud cast. These, yeah. are, these are very good friends of mine and from the beginning. It's our killer killer. Yeah. It's our text. <laughs> it's our killer killer. What are you on about? From the beginning, these guys have been absolute champion in my career and everything I do. If he's text, he's super tech because I sure am spotty. How <laughs> <laughs> oh, fucking weird, <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mongo, Skinny Man, Mud Fam. No, no. Killer Killer Mud Fam. Till <laughs> next time. Killer Killer Mud Fam. <laughs> That's goodbye from him. Yes. And it's, it's goodbye, goodbye from, from him. him. Yeah. <laughs> Stay lucky, people. Peace. Yes. <laughs>